Hi, I'm Fernando Tomlinson. Welcome to Gaming 2020 Vision during an incident with PowerShell. This is the PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit for 2021, and I'm excited to be here. A little bit about myself. I've been with the Department of Defense for roughly 19 years, specifically the U.S. Army. I've led incident response teams. I've done vulnerability assessments and pen testing, and currently I do forensics and malware analysis for the United States Army. I'm a cybersecurity adjunct professor where I teach PowerShell, Python, and a little bit of ethical hacking. I'm a PowerShell enthusiast. I've been developing and coding in the language for over six years, developing a number of red and blue team tools. I've also developed some educational platforms, which I'll talk about throughout this talk. I'm a contributor to the PowerShell Conference book, Volume 2. And as you know, no proceeds from that book go to the authors, but instead it goes to underrepresented, underprivileged individuals trying to get a start in cybersecurity. I have a presence on the internet, and I'm looking to always connect with like-minded individuals. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. All right, so why incident response with PowerShell? Well, if you're in incident response, you've likely been here, where failure is coming, and you can sometimes see it, but it's not enough time for you to react. And then you might have been in the opposite of that, in which you've had a plan for when things go wrong. Well, not every time you have a plan, it actually works out the way you desire. And that's why we have incident response. Okay, so what is this incident response? Looking at three reputable companies within this arena, Force Port, First Point, excuse me, Alien Vault and Sands, they all have their own definition. However, they all seemingly say the same thing. And when we look at incident response phases, well, we look to generally to different entities. Well, we look to regulatory uh, stuff in NIST, and NIST has it broken down into four phases. And then we look to SANS, a well-known reputable company within the cybersecurity spectrum, and they break it down into six phases. Well, as you can imagine, there's some overage between both of them. And as such, we can kind of see the overage comes really in phase three of NIST, where that's phases three, four, and five within SANS. And from an incident response perspective, where we're responding to incidents with PowerShell, well, we're largely going to focus in the phases two and three of NIST and phases two, three, four of SANS. And that's where we see an overage, right? We're going to be able to use PowerShell from some aspects of detection and analysis, but also how we do containment eradication and recovery within an organization. So some common approaches right now are for entities and organizations to use commercial uh, platforms. And these commercial platforms are awesome. I've, I've used a number of them and, and I, I certainly like them. However, they come with a price tag. And depending on the organization, you may not be able to afford that next gen uh, EDR, if you will. So then you might look to some open source platforms and I've used a number of them as well and they're generally pretty good. But guess what? Depending on your organization, they may not allow you to utilize those open source uh, platforms. Or if you're doing incident response as a service, you may go into a network that A, doesn't have that next-gen EDR in a commercial aspect, and, or B, doesn't allow you to bring your own uh, EDR. So what do you do? Well, this is where you look to PowerShell, and we'll get to that. Generally, these EDRs come in the aspect of either they have an agent on the system or their agent list, and they typically provide us with things like visibility into the network, some intelligence, and the ability to do fast response should we get to that point. Well, if you don't have either the open source uh, platform or, again, you can't afford or your organization uh, won't pay for a commercial platform, then you may feel like your toolbox is like this. And nobody needs to feel like your toolbox is like this because guess what? In a Windows perspective, by default, we have PowerShell. And guess what? Now that it's open source, we also can install it on other platforms as well. But specifically from a Windows perspective, we have this already resident and waiting on us. So your toolbox really looks like this, right? When you break it down and you truly understand PowerShell and all the features in which you can utilize it for. Okay, so as we go a little bit deeper here, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the disclaimer. And for some, this is a TLDR, that's too long, didn't read. 
And for others, it's a TSCR, which is too small, couldn't read. So, so let me just sum this up here. I'm not saying that commercial tools are of no use, but I'm merely highlighting how PowerShell can enable you to find things or do things without them, okay? Again, I wanna make sure I'm very clear in that uh, delineation. Okay, so with that, let's jump into this. We're not gonna talk about everything you can do on PowerShell. As you can imagine, I don't have the time, uh, although I would love to, um, but we'll talk about a couple of things in which we can utilize PowerShell for. The first one, we'll talk about Internet Information Services, IIS. So if you're running a Windows server and you're running a web server off that Windows server, generally you might be using IIS, something that's built in. Well, guess what? IIS as a web server is no different than any other web server in that malicious entities are going to try to access your web server. It's going to be likely public facing, which means those same entities or other entities may look to try to exploit uh, that machine and try to get onto it. So what do you have? You have logs. These logs provide vital information such as source IP, the URI, uh, the method, the refer, and a number of other things. These logs are going to be generally stored in the system root. That's going to be a C drive, and then init pub log files. Now, these logs by themselves, they're pretty difficult to read without parsing. Right? They're pretty difficult. The, the data is in there. The answers you're looking for is in there. Um, but they're difficult to read. And this is where we're going to use PowerShell to parse that and make it easier for us. Uh, the caveat here is they don't write to the event log by default, which is something you may want to have so that way you have some system of record. These logs definitely enable you to catch somebody doing malicious behavior. Now, the logs by default look like this, and we see a whole lot of stuff on the screen. The thing I really want to draw your attention to is what's highlighted in red here or circled in red, and that's going to be the fields uh, area, and that's going to have the fields lined to every piece of data in there. And understanding that, we can then take a step back and look at how that log gets populated. Well, we have a attacker on the left and we have a good person on the right. And the attacker is going to try to access the resource. And in this case, they're just gonna do the root of the, the file server, or excuse me, the web server, and it should redirect somewhere else. And if they're successful and that page is rendered and a resource is there, they're gonna get a response code of 200 back. And we see them continuously doing that and getting response codes up to under back, meaning that resource is there available. Now, if we see them going off the beaten path, uh, i.e., uh, in, in the case of this, where they're getting this, uh, the root of the uh, web server again, and they're getting 200, and then we see slash DB, almost like they're looking for a database, if you will, or slash CMD.php, which is notoriously associated with web shells. In both of those cases, we see a 404, meaning the resource not found. Those are the things that we can see in our log file. Again, looking at the fields area, we're going to parse that, turn that into an actual object within PowerShell, and then we can out, uh, we can view it in something like out grid view or whatever it is that you like. But now we have an object and we turn those fields into properties. So we can cleanly see what we couldn't see necessarily before. I see things like PHP my admin, almost like somebody is in thinking that I'm hosting a web server utilizing PHP and I'm not. I also see things like WP admin, almost thinking that I'm using a WordPress server and, and I'm not. We see things near the bottom, cmd.jsp, shell.php. Again, both of those are notorious with web shells, right? Think of maliciousness when we think of web shells. Somebody's gained access put a back door on our web server, and now they're trying to connect to that resource as a method of backdooring into our platform. But again, when we take that log and we're able to parse it, we're able to see some things that are a lot clearer to us that necessarily weren't necessarily clear to us before. We can also do things like grouping. So we can utilize the group object commandlet within PowerShell because I want to start to understand not necessarily the periodicity, but more or less the rate of occurrence of what resources are trying to be um, gathered from my web server. And when we do this, I see things like shell.php and command.jsp were done once and oh, lo and behold, from the same uh, IP, that's interesting. That WP admin where somebody thought I was running WordPress, that's interesting. The PHP my admin, there's 11 instances or 11 unique IPs rather 
in which somebody trying to access that. So now we start to get a little bit clearer picture in our logs. Okay, that's interesting. Now, looking at invoke PS geolocator is a script I wrote where we can take the IPs, utilize ipapi.com, a free API, and then we can get some geolocation off of okay? And I'll pause here because I wanna say any piece of code that I talk about within this talk is gonna be resonant on my GitHub. I, I, I'm not the type of person that talks about code that I write and doesn't share it. So you can find all this code on my GitHub. Okay, cool. So now we see IPs that are accessing our web server. We don't have a good understanding of which from where they're coming from, so we can utilize this uh, invoke PSG locator with the free API that you will have to get from API, IP, IPA, IP, IPA.com. And then guess what? Now we can geolocate based upon those IPs. And if you're hosting a web service that you typically cater to one geographical area versus another one, well, you might start to see um, indications of possibly maliciousness because somebody is coming from a different area. Now, this doesn't come without holes because people who are really serious in this arena, more sophisticated in nature, aren't going to come from their home country in trying to uh, penetrate through your network. They may try to get a VPS located in the general country in which um, your system is operating on. So we take this with a grain of salt. However, we see how we're able to take our logs that aren't really in a manageable state, convert them into an object with properties, and then we can do things like group them together, and then we can utilize uh, this PSGO locator and get some geolocation off of those IPs. So now we're making more sense of our IIS logs. We also have things like virus total. Virus total is, uh, it could, could be amazing, right? I wouldn't recommend uploading any binaries to it, but we have the ability to um, get reputations based upon IPs, domains, and a number of uh, hashes and a number of other things. So with this, we can absolutely go to the GUI of VirusTotal, VirusTotal.com, and we can put this information in and we'll get some data back. That's too time intensive. Instead, what we can do is we can utilize their API. They have a free API, but they also have an API that you can pay for expensive in nature. And we can write some code, which we have, and utilize that API in, in an automated fashion, send requests to VirusTotal and get that data back. Now, here's the limitation with our free API. We can only do four requests per minute, and we see how many we can do within a daily and a monthly uh, submission as well. So what does this look like for us? Well, utilize an invoke proc VT scan, another uh, piece of code that I wrote. Um, you're able to feed it uh, IPs, hashes, whatever you want based upon what virus total will take. And then understanding that we can do four per minute, uh, it takes whatever you submitted it and then it already does that math for you. And then it spits it back out so you have an understanding of what it is that is actually doing for you. Uh, now, this is gonna come back to you as a table or a list. We see what the list looks like. The table is gonna be a little bit easier to read, uh, at least for me in this aspect as an analyst because now I'm able to see up front, my first column, what uh, it, antiviruses it was queried, uh, the version of them, whether it was true or false. If it was true, it tells me what that AV knows that malware family is. It tells me the uh, that file, essentially the signature file, the data associated with it. And then the last column, it tells me what it is I actually submitted. So when I do it like this, things start to stick out for me, right? I see a couple of instances out of the 50 of this screenshot in which some AVs think that this file is malicious. That's enough for me to, to, to warrant some attention towards the file to do some deeper analysis. But we can start to automate this so that way we can start to get a better understanding of things that are running on our network. Or as we're doing some very targeted response actions, we can utilize this code also to do those queries on our behalf. Okay, so looking at event logs, at this point as PowerShell enthusiasts, right, and masters of PowerShell, you recognize that there's two instances for us to query PowerShell logs. We got get win event, we also get, we also have get event log. Get event log is gonna be deprecated, focused on XP 2003, but it still works 
for modern versions of Windows, but only our classic logs. And then get one event not only works for classic logs, but event tracing logs. Those are the more modern logs for Vista and newer. Both of them have the ability to, to query event logs from uh, remotely, but get one event has the ability to parse offline event logs. So this is key when we look at doing incident response because that's a place of record when we look at things that are happening on our system. And here are some um, high visibility, useful event IDs within the event log. Unfortunately, not all uh, event IDs are enabled by default. There's some auditing that may have to get enabled for them to be useful. And one of them is 4688 process creation and by far one of the most helpful ones, in my opinion, um, when doing incident response. Why? Because malware is gonna execute in two fashions. It's either gonna execute in memory, and we'll save that for another day, or it's gonna execute on my file system, and that process creation is gonna help me determine that. So when I look at that, um, just this view isn't helpful. It essentially tells me when a process was created and a date, but it doesn't tell me anything more than that. So I can expand this, right, and look at it um, uh, from a list view as opposed to table. And I see my properties on the left-hand side. And the property that contains the most data for me is the message property. It's got the stuff I care about, like the account name, the domain name, right, uh, the process name, where it actually executed from, right? Those are things that I care about. So if I were looking for any process creation uh, event log where the account name contained or like woof, I would get a number of logs back, but I would, I would always get essentially that whole message fill. I don't want that whole message fill because there's a lot of fluff in there, right? I don't have the ability to specifically say where the account name uh, is like woof. Instead, I'm doing where message contains woof, right? So that doesn't actually mean that I'm talking about woof as an account name. It could be woof shows up as a new process name, woof shows up as some other text in there. So there's a lot of room for error there. So what we can do is we can take another property called properties. And within those properties, we have the ability to parse our message field a little bit deeper. And we can really pull out the things we care about. As such, I've pulled out the process, command line, account, and creator. Now, I've changed those property names as I've parsed those and pulled them out. But now I'm only getting the stuff I care about and none of the other fluff. And when I do this, things become possibly a little bit clearer for me. I see things like a process of netcat, MC64 is netcat, and I see it talking to an IP on quad fours, right? Essentially, uh, quad fours is the default for Metasploit. So I think this is possibly bad at the moment, and I see it being kicked off by a process of command.exe. So command prompt is kicking off netcat. That's probably not good, and I see that command line associated with it. Again, get us some clarity in my event logs. And if you're like me, maybe you, 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 know, you like uh, OutGrid View, you can certainly pipe, pipe it to OutGrid View because we uh, then created or sustained the object itself. So those properties are still there. Now, we also have the ability with event logs to log what is not being logged, right? Let me put my malicious hat on. I'm gonna log, gain access to a machine, I'm gonna look around and survey it, see what they already have logging, and then based upon what they have logging, I'm then going to deploy a specific tool or tools based on what is already being logged. If I don't know what's logging, I could not intentionally, but purposefully, if you will, deploy tools thinking that I'm in the clear. So we can create custom logs. And when we do this, we can specify our own event ID. We can write these to a, a source of its own, or we can do it to the application log. In this case, that's what I did. And then I can put in the details whatever it is that I want. Why? Because if I'm writing to a flat text file, I don't believe an adversary is gonna get on my system and not clean that file if they're found to be in there. So instead, I want to commit it to something like the event log 
where they need to be very sophisticated to wipe an individual entry in the event log, or if they try to wipe the entire event log, it generates an 1102 event log telling me something was wiped. Again, just giving me a record um, in a place that's a little bit more difficult to wipe. So if I thought about a methodology for this, it would be something like this. Retrieve the data that's of interest based upon some script that we have. Maybe we have it in a wild loop, or maybe we have a WMI subscription. So as something happens, this then triggers. We're gonna filter for what we care about, and then we're gonna write the data of interest to the event log. All right, sounds like we're winning when we do that. Now, what if you want to get it to a scene, essentially a log aggregation, a platform, but you can't afford one, or again, your organization won't allow you to use one of the free ones that are out there to open source it. Well, you can utilize Slack or any other um, messaging platform as a log aggregation service, right? And there's some pros to this because it's an alternative to the Windows event forwarding where we can take the Windows server and turn it into our log aggregation server. It enables real time notice, right? Because as a message gets written to a channel in which you own and you're monitoring, you're loaded on your devices, it ensures logs are shipped somewhere else. And this is key because although you're getting it to an event log, it still stands a chance and an opportunity for somebody to try to alter it. And we talked about those measures in which they can alter it in previous slide, but we really want to get it off the system somewhere else. That makes it really difficult for somebody to compromise. Now, the cons using, using this is we're putting this data on somebody else's server. There are some transient concerns because we may not fully understand um, that communication with Slack. And it's certainly not suitable for enterprise use. So we're gonna utilize the invoke PS Slack code written by um, Warren Frame, right? And by itself, we see things like, well, we would put in our API key, which we don't see here, but uh, we're essentially having the ability to say what we want the message to, to say. Uh, the bot name, you can do an emoji and a number of other things. In this case, I'm going to a channel called Jin and I'm gonna say howdy. And when we look at this, it looks like a regular message. Okay, interesting. So I'm gonna take that and we're gonna expound on it. So our methodology now is we're gonna retrieve the data. We're gonna filter for the items that we care about. We're gonna write the data of interest to the event log. And then we're gonna monitor the event logs for the events and when there's an event of interest written to the event log, we're going to send that event log to Slack. Okay, you with me? All right, so let's look at the event uh, invoke PS Slack code again. Now, the big thing here is we've added in our get one event so we can look for the event logs that we care about. And then the second circle in red, essentially, we're going to format what we want the message to look like. For the most part, everything else with some slightness, if you will, is the original code. Okay, so what does this look like in Slack? Well, it looks like some formatted data being written. And I see things like um, essentially this PowerShell code that's base64, that's likely uh, malicious. Not many admins that I know of are base64 in code, but now I'm seeing this outside of my platform, my operate, my Windows system, but instead somewhere else. And for an actor to compromise this, uh, it takes them a little bit more work, right? So we're getting it committed to the event log. We're then getting it off the actual system, almost like we would do backups, right? You don't do backups on your system. You get them off the system somewhere else. Same thing we're doing here. Again, not suitable for enterprise use, but certainly suitable for high ticket items. Okay. Uh, for anyone doing incident response or defense in nature, when you get on a system, you generally want to look at what processes are running and what uh, connections or um, open ports it has. The process list essentially is going to give us things like the names of the binaries and the path and the PIDs. And in some cases, we can get the parent process ID, essentially what started the process, right? And then when we look at our connections, we see what port on our machine is connecting to another port on a distant machine and we see the IP associated with it. And if we have a service that we're listening to, um, maybe like web server or SSH server or whatever, we see the port that we're bound to on our machine. 
when we're looking at this, we also have the ability to look at what processes are tied to either those open ports or those uh, connections. And we can get this from the perspective of taking the process ID from get process and utilizing the owning, I, owning process uh, within our NetStat or our get net TCP connection. That's the NetStat version of uh, PowerShell. And then lining it up. My problem is when I'm looking at get process and I remember a PID of 11388, by the time I do my get net TCP connection, I don't remember if it was 33188 or something else. So there's some human error in this whole thing. What I'm gonna do is reduce that human error. And we can do that by just taking something like this as an example, right? We got Reese's cups, we got Reese's pieces. And when you put those together, we have pure magic. So that's what I was seeking to do when I did get verbose process. We combine the process list and connection list together. We're gonna to reduce the human error, human oversight. And this is gonna paint a clearer picture for an analyst. This is also exportable to your favorite format, CSV, XML, JSON, whatever. Why? Because you may want to import this into a scene for larger analysis, and you'll be able to do that. So when we look at this, we got two individual events or instances, and we're now able to clearly see the local IP and the ports associated with it. We're able to see what binary uh, or process is tied to it in the PID but we're also able to see where it exists on the file system, the full path to it, as well as the command line. We see the parent process, i.e. the process that kicked off the process that has the connection. And we see things like where it exists on our operating system, but also the hash associated with it. That's great. For any of you who are utilizing McAfee products out there, McAfee, uh, when it triggers on something, it has the ability to remediate that for you. And when it does that, that option is essentially called deletion. But it doesn't really delete it. It actually quarantines it, and it puts it in C drive uh, quarantine or system root quarantine. And it sits there for 28 days before it fully purges and deletes it. Now, have no fear, because if it's malicious, and McGabby thought it was malicious, and it puts it in that folder, they've essentially encrypted it or they've exhorted it and they've stored the key or somebody's put the key online. So we have that binary malicious sample sitting on our file system, but it's not in a format in which it can do more maliciousness. But because we have the key, we can reverse it. This is huge because somebody, as somebody who does forensics and malware analysis, it's one thing to know that something was malicious on the system and it's now remediated, cool but I want to analyze the malware so I can understand what it was doing. That's one. Two, what if it wasn't truly malicious and it was a false positive? But more or less because of uh, option one as a malware analyst, I want to be able to understand what it was actually doing, All right? So um, I wrote this code invoke unbup, right? And I call it unbup because it's dot BUP. So what does this look like for us? Well, we'll come over here and we'll walk through this. And within this, we're gonna go in and we'll do our, our uh, unbuck. All right, so I'll come in and I'll go to my code. And essentially, let me show you what it looks like. Right, they're all dot BUPs and they're randomly named, if you will. So that's what we're going to affect. And we're gonna feed it a path, and the path is gonna be C demos quarantine. Now, if you're doing this on a machine that has McAfee on it, the minute you put it back in its original state, McAfee is likely gonna trigger on it again. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna reverse that and then it's going to zip it and password protect it. By default, the password is going to be encrypted. I'm sorry, infected in a leap speak. So the I is going to be like a, a, a exclamation or what have you. But you can feed it whatever password you want. And when we run it, it's going to actually tell us. All right. So notice how it's telling us what the password is. And it has reversed that process for us. So now when I'm in here, we had the .bups before. But now I have the raw sample. And in this case, this is 
powerview.ts1. It's a zip. And the minute I go in here and I try to interact with it, it's going to prompt me with that password. So we were just able to reverse the McAfee uh, containing, if you will, of a malicious threat. So now as a malware analyst, I can actually conduct my malware analysis on this back on my analyst workstation and understand what that um, binary is actually doing. I call that winning, right? So we're no longer just been holding to um, the threat is neutralized and we're good to go. All right, so also came up with PowerShell rapid response. Uh, again, looking at it from a enterprise wide visibility and response uh, measure, this is allowing us to quickly identify anomalies. It's modular in nature where uh, PowerShell 2 is really the framework and then we have these modules that are embedded or imported into the framework. I say that because you yourself can continuously make these modules and use the framework as well. Right now, there's about 20 modules um, or plugins that are, are default in there, and it utilizes the pool method. The pool method, yes. So essentially on my server, I'm able to reach out to these machines, have it run the code, and I'm pulling it back. I say this because it's all about timing. If we had an agent on the machine, well, as, some, as soon as something happens, the agent sees it and then returns that data. So instead, we're going to be pulling and we're going to be pulling data and it's not going to be near real time. It's not even going to be real time. So we have to be cognizant of that. This data, when it comes back, it gets stored in CSVs, but also in a SQL database. SQL database utilizing SQL tools written by Warren Frame. Right, And each time we run this, we have a folder associated with the set of CSVs. That data is written to one database with multiple tables. And we utilize a network logon. So things like Mimikatz isn't a concern here because the network logon doesn't store those creds in such a way where Mimikatz can take advantage of them. All right, so here's those uh, modules, those plugins I talked about again, modular in nature, we can continuously add our own. So we'll come in here and we'll run Posh R2. All right, so when it comes up, I have the ability to just do it against all machines within the domain in which this system is, or I can import computer names, IPs from a file. I could also input a computer names, IPs mainly, or I could do my local system. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to input uh, an IPN, and we'll do it from another to another machine. So 172, 200. Now, notice that we can also supply the CIDR notation as well, so it doesn't have to be an individual machine. Now, it's off to the races, right? It's uh, multi-threaded in nature, so we don't have to worry about it being a single thread. As this data comes back, again, we'll be able to uh, see essentially that data um, within our folder. So you can see that I just have ran it now, and these are previous instantiations of it. So within there, as that data comes back, combined from all systems, uh, we'll be able to see it. And then we'll also be able to uh, see it within our SQL database. So data comes back, gets written, and then on the server itself, it gets uploaded or updated to our SQL database, right? And we can utilize things like SQLite, and we can go in there and actually read that database, right? Maybe you want to hook it up to a different front end, and you just want to utilize the SQL uh, back end uh, for something else, all right? So I'll come in here, and we can see that we have all these tables. These tables are essentially the plugins, and we can then do our queries using raw SQL commands, or we can have this database hooked up to some front end so we can be a little bit um, more granular in how we, we're going to do things. So as this is still going, once it gets done, again, takes all those CSVs on the server and then uh, updates our SQL database. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it. Uh, so we can just move on, but you kind of get the gist of how it actually works. Again, 
This is posh R2. All right, so moving on. We also have DNS, right? So if I'm malicious in nature and I have malware that I'm deploying on your machine, I want that malware to call back, uh, communicate back to my server. And the way that I would do this may be through a hard-coded IP address, but I may also use DNS. Well, let's understand the DNS process, right? If a user is trying to navigate to google.com, it's going to search the local host file, right? The host file on that machine and see if there's an entry with an IP address. If there's no entry, it check the local DNS cache of that machine. If there's no record there, it will then look to whatever DNS server it's configured to communicate with. And that DNS server will check its cache to see if it has the IP of that domain. If it does not, it will check to see if it's authoritative for that domain. And if so, it will return the IP associated with that record. If not, it will then either forward that request to another server or try to resolve it. Based, It all really depends on how it's configured. If we wanted to stop a system from talking to a known malicious domain and now understanding this process, we got two places in which we can do this. Well, we can do this with the host file by going into the host file and putting the domain name in there with a fake address, maybe 0.0.0.0, .0 or we can go and do it at our DNS server. If I'm doing one, two, even three or four or five machines, the local host file may work well. If I'm doing any more than that, that's gonna get old very quickly. Instead, I'll just do it at the DNS server level. So that way, as all my machines in my domain try to resolve it, I can just hit them off right there. And essentially sinkhole. Well, sinkhole, yeah, I'll, I'll use this picture. Let's say you have a car on the left-hand side and you're trying to get into the city, the city being on the right-hand side, if you will. And there's a gigantic sinkhole there. It is preventing you from getting to your destination. Essentially, you're gonna go in that sinkhole and never to be found or seen again, possible. And that's what we're looking to do with that malicious traffic. We're trying to prevent it from getting to where it is trying to go. So when we're putting a host record in for it, or we're utilizing our DNS server, we're gonna put an IP address that's not routable. And now when the system tries to go out to that IP address associated with the domain, it's not gonna go in. All right, now we can do this in automated fashion using invoke sinkhole domain. The fashion that we can do this is we can either supply domains that we want to sinkhole, or we can have it go out to reputable sites that carry global blacklist domains, if you will, based upon maliciousness, and we can just have them um, run those domains and, and become authoritative for those in your network. So the methodology here, execute the script, download the blacklist of domains or input domains you want to blacklist and then we're going to create what's called a forward lookup zone essentially this is going to make us authoritative for that domain and the record for that domain and subdomains is going to be quad zero so now when our system tries to go out to that ip address it's not going to make it there because it doesn't exist okay and we're essentially sinkholing that uh, domain now these forward lookup zones we see them off to the left and then we see how we have essentially a quad A record, quad A, excuse me, an A record. A record is going to be IPv4. We could also do quad A records. That's going to be IPv6. But the big thing here is we're becoming authoritative for these malicious domains, so our system can't talk to them. And then guess what? If we have the right logging, we can see when the machine tries to go out to these domains. All right. Now, in the context of malware analysis, Malware, when running in memory, uh, will seek to try to go into critical processes. Why? Because you can't really stop those critical processes. If we find ourselves in such a place where we're trying to do analysis, uh, we can utilize invoke suspend process. And this essentially attaches a debugger to a process and allows us to suspend it. So that way, anything that's dependent of it or um, it is depending on is not affected. This gives us the ability to then try to retrieve things like ransomware keys out of memory, or maybe try to dump uh, uh, binaries that were encrypted on our file system, but when executed in memory, uh, decrypt themselves. And then this also largely allows us not to break critical processes, right? So let's look at this.
All right, so for this, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna execute a binary that it only, its only job is to spin out an integer, right? And say beaconing home, that is all it does. And I'll come in and I'm going to execute my um, process to spin. And there has two functions. So we'll go ahead and we'll dot source those functions. And the functions that it has, actually let's go in here and get the process ID because we'll need the process ID. And the process ID is 5924 because that's what we're going to actually uh, submit to it. So we'll do invoke process to spin and we're gonna feed it an ID and we're gonna do 5924. Now, when we do this, notice how it stopped at 43. And for all intents and purposes, the process is still running. We've attached the debugger to it. Now I can go do my analysis tactics, right? Trying to outsmart the actor who has then uh, caused some pain to my network, if you will. And then when I'm ready to resume it, uh, I'll do essentially the same thing with the other function. And I will feed it uh, the ID in which I want to continue. So notice how we're at 43 and we're going to resume it and it will continue on, right? This is huge for our analysis, especially within incident response, right? Okay, so we have invoke fail to ban. I'm a huge fan of fail to ban. Fail to ban if you're not aware of it. If you have a public facing web server or server, just know somebody or something is trying to gain access to it every second of the day, every second of the day. And fail to ban essentially with configuration can set a threshold for attempts to access it. And then once people hit those thresholds, they are then put in jail or they're blocked from accessing your resource for a day, maybe a year, whatever you put in there, right? So that way people aren't able to just continuously try to tag your machine and try to brute force into it. Um, now I say this because Delta Band is a Linux thing. When I looked for it on Windows, I couldn't find anything. There's a couple of people in which tried to do something, but it wasn't quite meaning what I needed. So I ended up coming up with invoke fail to ban. So this allows us to configure those failed uh, logins, those thresholds. We can do IP whitelisting, uh, the ban, or essentially their timeout, their jail time, if you will, um, is configurable as well. And then there's an auto removal um, feature once that, that uh, time has been met. These blocked IPs get written to the event log. Well, you already know why, because we want to commit it. Um, it also logs our block whitelisted IPs. This data is being put in a SQL database. Again, thanks to SQL tools by Warren Frame. We have the ability to quickly remove all banned IPs. Maybe we don't want to go through and remove them all at one time. We can, in a very quick fashion, get rid of all of them. So uh, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. So I have my malicious person on the left. I got my legitimate person on the right. And my malicious person is trying to log in. Admin with the password of one, two, three. Admin with the password of seven, eight, nine. Admin with a password of P at sign dollar dollar. And on that last attempt, he is successful. He is able to gain access to that machine because he was just going down the line and unbeknownst to my legitimate machine uh, serving some web content, they had no idea and now they've been infiltrated. So what Phil the band seeks to do after that threshold is met, we wanna to totally put them in jail or essentially block them from having any communication with our source and then have a good understanding of why or who they are. Well, let's look at this. All right, so in this case, I'm gonna come in and when we do this, it's going to, again, write the IP and information about the person who tried to gain access to the machine to the event log. It also creates a firewall rule. That's what actually blocks that communication. When their time is up, it removes that firewall rule and then allows them to communicate with them again. So I say all this because for this demo, I've created it to be rather aggressive. I think it's like three or four failed logons within a 30 second time frame, and then they get put in jail. I also have some stuff 
printing to the screen just so we can be cognizant of what's going on. So we'll come in here and we'll execute this code. And right out the gate, I can get started by option one, start monitoring. I can list the banned IPs and their status, i.e. IP1 has been banned. It was banned on this day. It's still banned. IP2 was banned on this day. It's no longer banned. I can list all the whitelisted IPs. And by default, it's already going to pick up all the IPs associated with the mix on my system, but I can also add more. And then if I'm just in a hurry, maybe I messed up or something, um, I can just unban all IPs. So I'm going to come in here and we'll do option one to start monitoring. Um, and it says, hey, the IPs of my system will be whitelisted. Do we want to whitelist any other ones? And I'll say no. And then it will show me the IPs associated with my machine. OK, awesome. Now we're off to the races. I'll come over here and I'll try to log in a couple of times incorrectly. And once I've met that threshold, um, we'll then see where our machine is uh, going to be blocked. Okay. I uh, might have missed it. All right. We keep going here. Maybe 30 seconds was too aggressive, especially when I'm trying to hurry up on this side. All right, cool. So now we've made it. I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at the firewall rule. All the firewall rules for band communication begin with ban underscore and then the IP address that was banned. We also see within our event log um, that we created the event. We've done an idea of 1337, and this is going to be in our event log until that event log gets wiped. Now, after it's been in jail or been banned for whatever period of time that we configured, which I think was like 30, 45 seconds, we'll see a message back on the screen saying it's been removed and it can now essentially communicate with our machine. All right, cool. So that time frame has been uh, hit. We can come back in here and try to look at that firewall rule again. And we'll notice it's gone. However, that entry in our event log is still there. So in an automated fashion on Windows servers, we can employ fail to ban, invoke fail to ban, excuse me, and have this thing essentially watch our back and prevent people from just brute forcing our server every second of the day. All right, so as we make our descent towards the end of this talk, uh, there's some pitfalls of PowerShell for incident response, right? We're trusting PowerShell and we're trusting the Windows API. And if a malicious actor is already on that machine, there's a chance that they may affect uh, PowerShell and the API. So we're taking some chances there. The network in which we're doing our incident response with PowerShell may not be fully configured to use PowerShell remotely. And then PowerShell may not answer everything we need. It's certainly not a 100% solution, but it provides a lot, right? So we need to be cognizant of that as well. Now, I'm not the first person to talk about PowerShell for incident response. There's a number of, of people and entities and frameworks of sorts that are out there. I advise you to go look at them. Um, it certainly would be worth your time and effort. All right, so as you came into this talk, again, you probably thought your toolbox was like, like this if you couldn't have one of those commercial tools or open source tools and you know you realize very quickly your toolbox is like this but guess what i have a couple more things to add for you if you're just starting off in the language there's no better use or thing to have by you than a cheat sheet right so i created this cheat sheet to kind of give you the important things of powershell so that way as you build repetition then you can slowly uh, get off of it if you need to. Or you just tape it to your desk and you always have it there. So this cheat sheet's out there for you and you can find it at the link listed below there. Now, uh, some buddies of mine and I created what's called Under the Wire. We developed this in 2015. To date, Under the Wire has 75 interactive challenges. They are linear in nature, meaning you're gonna do one after the other. They are focused on the core concepts of PowerShell. And the very premise of this site is to help 
people learn PowerShell or hone the skills that they already have in the language. We make no money off of it. This is a free resource to you. To date, we've had approximately 160,000 unique players from over 78 countries. Under the wire can be found at that site. Let's go through one of these challenges. All right, so when I get to under the wire, I'm presented with this. I'm gonna go to war games and there's five different war games. Each of them have 15 levels, 15 levels. The first one that I'm gonna do is Sentry and it will tell me how I get the password. Essentially, I'm gonna go to the Slack channel and join and that's where you can find me and uh, my friends providing um, support. But I'm gonna fast forward past that and I'm going to make believe like I already have the password. And that previous screen told me where I'm going to SSH to. So I'm going to SSH as Century1, that's the first user, to century.underthewire.tech. It would help if I actually put the actual SSH command in. Right? And then I'm going to put in that password that I would have gotten from the Slack channel to get started. Now I'm in the platform. I'm in a PowerShell shell. Notice I don't have a GUI or anything else. Now, once I'm in here, I'm going to understand and look at what my challenge is. It tells me the password for a century two, which is the next level. Another user is another level in this game, all right? Is the build version of the instance of PowerShell installed on this system. It gives me some notes as well. The short of it is I'm gonna do something like uh, dollar sign PS version table, and I'd be able to see the build version. And I'm going to take that, and now I would SSH back in using another window as Century 2 in that same server, and I would feed that uh, build version as the password. And then I'd move on to the next level. And I'm going to continue that all the way down until I get to level 15, and I conquer the game. Each time I'm either learning something new because I have to do some research or I'm just building repetition with things that I already know. All right. So that is under the wire. Now, I also came up with Posh Hunt. Did this in 2017. This is over 90 challenges that are non-linear in nature, meaning that you can just jump around and go wherever you want. This is squarely focused on red and blue team tactics from a PowerShell perspective. It's very scenario driven. So I put you in the stance of a defender or I put you in the stance of a malicious person using PowerShell. You're gonna have to download a virtual machine that I have um, listed on the site because all the artifacts associated with this game are in that virtual machine. And what you'll do is you'll create an account on the Posh Hunter site, and then you'll be able to see all the challenges, right? Some of them are just pure question and answers. Some of them are, again, talking about a scenario. I'm putting you in the mindset, right? And you'll supply that answer. If you get the answer wrong, no harm, no foul. If you get the answer right, you'll get the points associated with that question. Some of them have hints associated with them as well. If you take the hints, you'll lose a smaller number of points. Um, but no, far, no, no foul, no harm uh, in that aspect. You are learning, right? And that's what uh, Posh Hunter is really all about. So I've put in your toolbox, not only how to use PowerShell from an incident response perspective, but also a PowerShell cheat sheet, also a game server me and my buddies came up with under the wire, also a game server that I came up with, Posh Hunter, and I would say you're set. Right. So now let's jump into the finale. here. Right. Commercial tools are great if your organization can afford them. Open source tools are great as well if your organization will allow you to use them. PowerShell can provide access to vital data in your organization or within your, your, your premise as a incident responder, enabling you to do more with less. But guess what? Everything comes with some cons. PowerShell is certainly no different in that aspect. All right. Again, I'm Fernando Tomlinson. This has been Gaining 2020 Vision with PowerShell during an incident with PowerShell. If you're interested in the slides associated with this talk, you can find them at the link shown there. If you're interested with any of the code I talked about or just any of the code period that I have, 
And not only PowerShell, but in the array of languages, you can find those on my GitHub. And if you just want to connect, right, because you're into the same things that I'm into and you want to have a conversation, I'm certainly game from that. I'm a human being just like everybody else. And you can find me on uh, Twitter. With that, that concludes my talk. I'll be hanging out, answering any questions and partaking in the other talks as well. So thank you for having me. Uh, take care.